magic hour has arrived and we will call the finance and operations committee meeting of January, whatever it is, 25th to order. And the roll call shows that uh, Councillor Gardner, Councillor Osher, and Councillor Perry are present. Um, next item on the agenda is discussion Orono Public Library Foundation expansion project. Are you introducing that for us, uh, Sophie? I would be happy to. Um, I'm actually going to introduce Lori Carpenter. Um, our library director. Um, she is taking the lead on this project from the town's perspective, and my job is to back her up. Um, Lori, are you all set? Or Sorry, I'll unmute myself there. Um, yeah, hi, thanks. So we are um, working with the Orono Public Library Foundation that's um, been in existence now for probably 15 years. I've lost track of time. Um, they've been instrumental in helping us raise funds first for the building and then for the Orono Village Green and um, continue to work and look at the needs of the library. And James Jackson Sanborn is here. He's the president of the foundation at this time. And he's going to fill you in on uh, where, where the group is. Thank you. Yeah, as uh, Laurie mentioned, I'm James Jackson Sanborn. I am the president of the Orono Public Library Foundation and have been for a few years now. Uh, I came in just as the Orono Village Green was being opened and uh, finalized. So I have been there for uh, a little while now at least. Uh, our thinking tonight was that we would kind of fill you all in on some very early stages of activity that we've had that eventually probably a few years down the line, will involve the town quite a bit more uh, directly, but we thought that now would be a good time just to kind of share where we are and what we're doing and what we're thinking. Um, and the, the real uh, quick gist of all of that is that the foundation uh, has begun the initial process of planning for expansion of the existing library building. Uh, as probably you all know, um, and I think uh, Councillor Perry was very involved with the uh, initial building being built. The building we have now was designed or the initial idea was that it would be uh, bigger than it is now, um, but we built a great facility and it's been used and used and used um, and very successful. And we think that now is the time to begin thinking about expanding uh, to really fill the needs uh, and the plans that we would like to see moving forward for the next uh, 10, 20 years of the library. The library has been open for just over 10 years now, um, which kind of surprised me, I, I moved to town uh, back when the library was still part of the high school school library uh, and it quickly opened uh, in the new facility uh, shortly at, thereafter. So it's always been uh, a, a building that I've used. Uh, and so it still though seems like it was less than 10 years ago. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a real update of where we are, um, we don't have any sort of plans, any sort of schematic, any sort of even uh, um, timeline or architectural drawings yet for where we would like to be. But what we have done uh, is we have put out a call and selected an architect that's been hired by the foundation. That architect is in the programming stage right now, which is a stage before design stage. Um, where they are looking at what is happening in the space now, what we would like to be able to do in the future, anything that we might not be able to do now, um, what our needs and, and kind of hopes are for that. So we're working with the architect on one hand. Um, and the other thing that we have done is we have hired a fundraising consultant, uh, Alicia Nichols, who had worked with the foundation on the Village Green. And we've hired her to help us do 
uh, and needs assessment to do an evaluation of what we might be able to expect uh, for fundraising um, and to help us with what we're calling a pre-capital campaign um, where we're gonna be trying to raise the funds to bring us through a successful capital campaign. So we're not at the capital campaign stage and we're not at the design stage yet. Um, we're in very early stages. Um, so that, that's really what we thought we wanted to bring you all up to speed on at least, just so that you're in the loop uh, and you're not hearing from other, wait, I hear the library is doing all these things, what's going on? And, and then all of a sudden you say, you don't know. So now you know where we are. <laughs> um, anyways, I think that was really all that I had prepared to share. Um, but if, if Laurie has anything to add or Sophie's been uh, looped into some of these discussions as well, if I missed anything that I was supposed to share, let me know. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions, talk about what we're doing or whatever, whatever you all would like. Thank you, James. L Laurie, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I have nothing to add. James did a great job, um, you know, kind of outlining where we are at this point. Um, but I think both of us are willing to, and as well as Sophie, um, willing to answer any questions you might have. I, I, I guess my, my question for whoever feels they can respond to it is, I, I know you're in early stage, but I'm sure you have some idea of the need you're trying to address with the building expansion. And I'd like to hear a little bit about that if, if, if somebody's able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in real quickly and then Laurie can, can add to that as well. I think that uh, the areas that we have seen and areas that we had seen when the original building was being built that didn't make it into our final plan um, revolve around a few different areas. Uh, one of the areas is around community space. Uh, uh -huh. If you have been in our library for any community meetings, uh, you know that we have that very tiny little room at the front of the building um, that, that works well for really small groups, but uh, a couple times before pan the pandemic, I went to the Travel Tuesdays and it was standing room only and it was packed and, and really difficult to be there. So from my perspective, uh, personally, community space uh, and meeting space uh, that, uh, that the library can really use for programming is one of the top priorities. I know a couple other areas that we've discussed as being real needs um, is some mechanism through the building to help support our teen users uh, and or the other library users that are there when our building is full of teen users. Um, <laughs> you know, both are really important, but we want to make yeah. sure that, you know, we, we can meet the needs of, of both or of all the different communities that are trying to use the building. But, but uh, teen use is one area that we're really interested in, uh, in meeting their needs without, uh, without, without inconveniencing other users at the same time. Right. Um, and then I also think that there is some real need. One of the areas that got uh, cut back on with the original building uh, and in, uh, it is staff, uh, staff space. Uh, and whether that's around a kitchenette, back when we had, uh, that would be great for something like that, some extra staff offices, um, or even some space where staff can be a little bit less in the middle of the library when they need to be. Uh, we had a staff member who had a baby uh, and had to, having to use, I'm seeing the curtains in Laurie's office right now. You know, there was no good space for her uh, as a nursing mother um, to get out of the open space in the library. So a little bit of staff space would be great. Um, and those are really the three biggest needs that I have kind of in my wish list. Um, I think part of the programming that we'll be doing with the architect is to determine what other needs the community might have um, and areas of success that we can really grow on. Yeah. Um, and I'll just, um, you know, add to it. James hit all the high points, I think. Um, but as far as community space, he talked about adult programming. And one of the biggest needs is children's programming. We can have a children's program that will attract um, 50 kids and their parents 
or grandparents or, <laughs> you know, various other people. And we just can't do it um, in the space we have. When we were in the school, we were using their cafeteria or their um, gymnasium, which seemed inconvenient at the time. Now we actually have to go to Asa Adams or um, the Keith Anderson building or another building in town if we're going to have a program that will attract that many um, children and their parents. So it's a need for all ages. Um, I once heard a statistic that the number of people walking to a public library um, public library's doors any one day is 60% for children's programs. So um, really focusing on um, that demographic is, is pretty important. And once those children grow up and they become teens, James you know, talked about that as well. Um, and part of our issue too, is we have this beautiful open space with cathedral ceilings and the sound just travels. So mm -hmm. while well, some people really enjoy having that open space for their kids where they can go look at magazines while their children in, are in the children's room, it does interrupt others who want a quiet space. You know, we have people come um, in the evenings. Oftentimes um, we have tutors who come and try and find a quiet corner or just someone studying or wanting to, to sit and have a quiet space. So one of the issues is dealing with the, um, how sound travels. And so that's a real challenge for the architects to figure that out. We don't necessarily want a lot of walls and compartments, but we want to somehow uh, manage the sound issues. Um, and the staff workspace is, I mean, staff space in general, but the workspace, we often have to move things from one flat surface to another in order to get work done on that flat surface. So um, there are just numerous things, but those are, those are the, um, yeah, the main points. And it'll be interesting as we go about um, interviewing uh, or having focus groups to see what other people are thinking yeah. um, that, that are needed, that is needed. Um, people space is just like the biggest thing. I know when we first opened and it has happened a number of times, I'll think that the library is very quiet and where is everybody? But walking around the library, I see all the seats are taken. So um, that's before the kids come. So <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> anyway, so people space is a biggie. We, we do um, our collection takes up a lot of space. Um, which it should, we, you know, that's what we do. We have materials to loan, um, but people more and more are coming to the library just as a community space. Um, yeah, so okay. I guess that's, that's what I'll finish with. I don't know yeah, if you have well, thank you, that, that certainly answers my question. Appreciate it. Yeah. Questions from other counselors? Any additional information we need? No, oh, Tom, that was exactly my question too. <laughs> and very thorough answers. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any anybody else? So well, James. So, uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah. So you're looking at expanding the existing facility. Was the original did the original design include a more space that wasn't used that the architects can then, you know, look at that for their expansion plan? Yes and no. Uh, there were various iterations, and, and this predates me, um, and I know Laurie wasn't the director at the time, and it predates Sophie. So we, we've pieced together some of this, and Laurie had some background, and we've had other people on the committee who, were, uh, who did date back to the initial planning. The, uh, some of the initial designs were for a much bigger footprint for the main building. Um, and then later designs were built with some expansion and modularity in kind of in theory there, um, whether it was the ability to add on at corners um, or to extend or, you know, towards the front, there are various thinking and plans on that. And some of the, um, some of the, the, I'm blanking on the word right now, but the, the electrical, the air handling, some of that was built with expansion in mind and has terminus points and, and entrances and exits that can be expanded and used. Um, that said, with the value engineering that happens uh, when things get built with the money that's available, the building was smaller, the uh, actual uh, equipment, the, the heater, the cooling that ended up coming in later, some of that might need to be, and we're still looking at that, 
early days, um, might need to be expanded in order to handle the additional capacity and the additional sizing of the building. Um, also, in the meantime, we had the Village Green that came on and that kind of means that one back corner at least isn't really available for expansion space. Um, but so there, we're, we're really trying to keep in mind past expansion ideas without letting them dictate what we're doing because the, the situation on the ground is different now than it was. James, Thank you. Good job. <laughs> well, I appreciate the update, uh, James and Laurie, and it's a very exciting project, and we are certainly going to look forward to hearing more about it as things move along. Right. I guess my one question, um, and whether this is this uh, this committee or through Sophie, how often? What do, do you want us to? Do you want us to trigger kind of, hey, we're hitting a milestone, we'd like to come back and talk to you? Do you want more regular updates? How, how, at this point, kind of wait and see, and then we'll come back. What, what works best for you all for future updates? So I'm going to jump in, and you guys can stop me if I'm wrong. But um, the way we worked it with the Village Green was an initial conversation so that community conversations didn't kind of get the catch the council up short. Then when we were starting to get into more conceptual pieces, if there were policy questions or um, priorities that um, I thought would rise to council discussion, I would bring them back or Lori and um, Sarah, I think was Sarah. at the yeah. time, um, mm -hmm. would come and, and talk with you. But the goal here is for um, council to kind of keep the 30,000 foot view. And um, as you um, get the concept, I think would be a good place to come back just to make sure that there's nothing with the conceptual plans that council would object to accepting as a gift. Um, and then kind of moving on from there. What do you think about that committee? I think that's on target from my perspective. I, I think um, James mentioned milestones and I, I think that's that's also a good catch um, point um, when there's a um, one process coming to a conclusion, um, that's a good time to update update council. I don't think it's something that, that they need to come back to us uh, on a specific every three months or every four months, I think is more of a milestone kind of thing or if there's an issue that needs to be discussed. That makes sense to everybody? Yes, okay. it does. Great. Hi. Sounds good to me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time and your efforts. So you're gonna have a lot more a lot more involvement going forward, James. Yep. <laughs> I've been there and know that. Yep. Okay. Yep. I guess we'll move, move on to our next item then if we're all set with that. Uh, and our, our next item is purchasing and installing a generator for the town office. So this is an item that has been on our um, wish list for a while. It hasn't made it up onto the capital plan because um, it is a uh, something that while uh, would certainly be helpful um, to allow us to operate with less um, stoppage, um, it, it is not, we have not um, reached a place where I can come in and argue that this absolutely positively happens and, and is absolutely necessary and that we um, need to spend $65,000 to, mm. to um, make it happen. However, I don't know if people have noticed, but we've been losing the power more and more, wind storms, electrical outages. And the way the town office and public safety building were constructed, we share many systems. So we actually share some electricity. Um, the um, boiler in the town office actually heats and cools public safety. So there's a lot of shared infrastructure that moves between the two buildings. Um, 
which is wonderful. Uh, when they put when they constructed public safety, they uh, included a generator. However, that generator is sized to run public safety and instead we're running part of public safety and um, the heating and cooling system here um, in the town office and a couple of um, kind of hodgepodge um, systems within the town office. There is really no rhyme or reason as to what, huh. what will run or what won't run. Um, so like, for example, I can't hold people here for too long because if we lose power because I don't have bathrooms, I don't have lights in bathrooms and other safety uh -huh. features. Um, so we, um, and that's just one very small example, but like people's offices aren't lit. Um, so I, um, we have had it on our agenda that one of the goals that we have is to be able to um, run the town office and the public safety building um, when the power is out so that there should be no, no interruption to services. Right. We, um, and part of that is because sometimes when the power is out, especially on the windstorms, I have people trying to run back up to public safety response in both buildings. Um, so when the um, Center for Civic Civic Life Tech C Center for Tech and Civic Life, there we go, um, gave us uh, money to help us figure out how we could better secure and perform elections. Um, that was uh, almost one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. It caused us to kind of take two steps back and. Our first path swipe of that was how do we get this November election um, taken care of? And we spent a lot of money on cleaning and staffing and um, safety products. Um, that's where we bought the trailer to help us move more equipment back and forth um, between here and um, the University of Maine. Once we got that taken care of, we still had significant money left in the grant. And I think a lot of places did. And so the grantors came back and said, you can use this beyond November. So think about your elections in a more global context. And um, you have until the end of the year to spend the money, that being December 31st. So we got to December 31st and we still have about $55,000 left in the grant. Um, and so we submitted our report and a request for a six month extension, which was granted. And we came back, Bell and I sat um, and talked about, you know, we're thinking about what are some ways that we could provide better stability and security for our elections, which is partly, that's was part of the discussion we have with the security system that mm -hmm. we talked about and you bought last month. Um, that is That was bought with funds um, prior, not the $55,000 that was bought before. So um, the place we really came down to is with so much um, computerized and held in electronic form, if our power goes down, our ability to access databases, our ability to go into our systems, to go to our checks and balances diminishes. Our ability to get ballots, absentee ballots processed diminishes. Um, my staff is sitting in the dark as opposed to performing election functions. So at first we thought, is there a way that we could upgrade that would provide that service for just the town clerk's office? And that doesn't make any sense. It costs um, as much or more to just do that little piece. So um, Bell and our facilities folks um, reached out and we have a quote from um, Hamden Electric who is familiar with the oddities of 
the town office's electrical systems. And um, they are quoting us um, $63,450 uh, to install a generator and um, put in all the transfer switches um, that would allow this building to run as if it had power, um, even when the power is out. There is an additional, so 55,000 of the grant fund could go to offset that expense. There is an additional $4,300 that we would need to use to rewire public safety. That is not grant eligible, plus the grant funds are, would be um, exhausted at that point. So that would leave about $12,700 left that the town would have to come up with. You think about getting a generator to run our building and have public safety be able to run in its entirety um, for 12,000 local dollars is a pretty good deal. Um, so that's why we're bringing it to you. We don't have a lot of money in major maintenance uh, reserve. So my suggestion would be to take the funds that we saved in the debt with the refunding and repurpose that for this project. Okay. Some of that for this project. With a project of this size, Sophie, um, do we need to look at more than one possible provider or is it so unique that we only are gonna to go to one? So I am suggesting that we, um, I wanted to get the initial quote to get it into the ballpark. Mm -hmm. We want to put the full, um, I met with facilities last week and asked for two more quotes um, to give, put us in the ballpark, but I know it won't be any more than, right. Right. than this. Um, and Bell just chatted. It looks like I might be missing 2000. In order to get the locker rooms connected, there's not enough room left in the panel. So those have to be connected through the um, dispatch office. So that's at the uh, extra 2,800 or something like that. So it's a total of about 7,000 for the public uh, safety building. Okay. So, so that, that we need would- We add 28 to the 12,7? Yep. So that makes it 15,500. Yep. I think. So what I, if, if you are in general supportive of this idea, I would flesh it out, come back with a formal proposal, yep. either to the council meeting, if we're in the same ballpark or um, back to committee next month, if we're not in the same ballpark. Okay. It sounds Comments? pretty um, reasonable to me. I mean, I obviously <laughs> I live close to downtown and the losing power constantly is, yeah. Someone drives into a pole every other month and then no one has power for two days. And, you know, there's so many things about the electrical grid that are out of our control. There's also a lot about the election process that's out of our control and things that are dictated to us by the state. So having the ability to actually do that work regardless of the electrical situation is, is very valuable. My only curiosity is just, um, uh, were there other things on the list of consideration or was it pretty clear that like this was the, the mm. way to go? I'm gonna actually ask um, Belle to speak from beyond the curtain on that because this is her direct report department, but from what made it to my desk, I will admit I asked the question and then it came back that I was right, but maybe there was more. So um, we considered um, portable signs like you see that Maine DOT has um, to increase messaging around um, election day to make sure everybody knows how to get to where they need to get. Uh, but when we consider how many March elections that we have had that have been incredibly stormy, um, I think for a few years in a row, Shelly and I took selfies in the snow. Um, 
and just happened to be fortunate that we didn't lose power, uh, that the generator is just a much higher um, and wiser use of the funds. Plus, we'll also have that nifty electronic sign in front of town hall to advertise said election location. Uh, Absolutely. I, I think not only of elections, I think of um, the occasional hurricane we experience or some sort of a, a, a natural disaster that we lose power for an extended period of time. It's nice to know that our town office uh, will be fully functioning and everybody will be there doing what needs to be done. So it sounds like a good use of the funds to me. I think the team did a good job on this one. Yep. Any other questions or comments? I think you you have our support to go forward and flesh this out. Excellent. Great. Are we ready to move on to municipal budget process and timeline? So um, in your packet, I gave you a draft budget process timeline and you'll notice part of this is for internal work. This is the document that I publish for um, senior staff. And usually by the time you see it, I've chopped off all the front half stuff and we're mm -hmm. just dealing with the workshop. But um, the this particular budget timeframe, I am suggesting that, I was suggesting that we have a, a period that the town council would submit specific comments, questions to the town manager. But I was um, fortunate to have a conversation with a committee member earlier today and asking me kind of what I was, why I was making this suggestion. And um, it was, I think, to be a little bit more responsive to larger council um, priorities and needs. And so the question then became, well, why don't you just, once we get the council seated, the new council seated, why don't you just survey council and ask that question, what are your priorities that can help me as I put the budget mm -hmm. together? I think the, the major issue is we know that the coming budget is going to be a significant increase over last year. It has to be because we cut so much out of last year's budget. Um, and it would be helpful, I think, to under, for me to better understand council's um, priorities, if there are things that need to be shown in the budget or considered as I'm putting presentations together. So that was one item. I'm kind of interested in some feedback on that. The other item, you'll notice my my plan is to get the budget workbooks out a little earlier than normal so that we can try to go through without having to do two budget meetings a week because that gets kind of cumbersome. I tried to keep us at one budget meeting a week. However, some of those um, fell on Thursdays and some of them fell on uh, Mondays. So there would still be some weeks that council has two meetings but trying to keep one budget meeting the next is, um, and I think I mentioned it in my background, that um, this particular schedule of which departments go when is still up in the air because I look at the complexity of the budget when it comes together and I plug those, I plug it in so the more complex or larger budget changes go in the front so that you see them and you're not making decisions about um, a department that it, that maybe is asking for something that would really be great to have and could be construed as a need without understanding that over here coming, you're gonna see a really big absolute need. So um, it's kind of my, my thought and just wanted to get your feedback on kind of the budget process. Great. Comments from folks? Well, part okay. of the reason, oh, go ahead, Lori. You go ahead. Laura, we got you on the screen. Why don't you, why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, thank you. That sounds like a great idea to, uh, when the new counselors are seated to ask them. And where is, so I see 
the draft and which which date is that that they you have the so i had had um comments and questions to the town manager after you had had a chance to see the council um which would get the uh, budget which gets a which gets published on the 14th of um april the suggestion that came up that i actually prefer is to um, immediately following council being seated, talk, send a survey out about what are your priorities, what are your um, items that you um, would like me to consider as I'm putting the budget together, um, which will help me speak to things in the actual budget document. So I would push the survey going out closer to maybe the 12th of March with a request to have it back in by like the 29th of March. So give people a couple weeks. So that would go uh, after the second line that says March 1st to 12th, 2021 management budget review and meetings with staff. And then after that would be a line that says survey goes out to town councilors. Something like that, Lori. Um, yeah. The other option that we would have is on March 22nd to as part of finance and operations actually kind of do that exercise together. And I don't know what you prefer individual survey to me or a conversation at finance. I, oh, I think I think the survey is a great idea. And I just because you mentioned it and I, and I was looking at the notes you gave us, I just didn't see this in the line item, but I think that's a great idea. And uh, it doesn't preclude us having a conversation because since by statute or ordinance, we're not supposed to talk with each other unless it's in an announced meeting, then that's, uh, it gives us the opportunity to, to put our ideas down and have you interact with us about them because you're the one who has the sort of institutional wisdom about the big picture. Um, so we as individuals can then you know, give our information, but then uh, it sounds like good timing that we would then be able to talk with each other at a, at a committee meeting about what things we were interested in. Yeah, I think and that. by then we have, have had interaction with you about it. So we'd be more knowledgeable than just, oh, I, you know, I read that other places were doing this. Uh, we would have, you know, because you have so much knowledge about the process. So that's, I like, I basically, I think that we should have both of those things. Yeah. Sound good? Megan, were you, were you gonna comment on that? Yeah, I only wanted to say that the reason that that I brought this to Sophie was just because I feel like, I mean, I remember what my first um, year on council was like being thrown headfirst into the budget season and not really knowing a lot about the town budget ahead of time. And I, even as, you know, you know, four years oh. into budgets, I still feel that sometimes there gets to be a point where, you know, everything, we have such a tight budget and everything seems like such an important need. And it is so hard to cut as we all felt mm -hmm. this year in, in particular. And um, when you break it up into chunks like that and week after week, it's like every chunk of the budget seems essential. And so mentally you just get, it's like, I, I don't wanna cut that. No, we need all that, we need all that. And then you get to the end of the process and say, oh my gosh, we have to cut something. So I thought that um, before we, you know, get into that, frame of mind, it might be helpful for us to have a clearer sense of what we think the priorities are so that, you know, for example, we did have some disagreement about what to do with the library position in this year's budget. And I think that being able to um, sort of crystallize those thoughts a little bit ahead of time and kind of know where we're all at will be helpful for, our, for us, for each other, and also for staff as they're putting together their presentations. What would it be helpful as you did that if I preface the whole conversation and the whole survey with the things that I see as the priorities that I plan to put into the budget or the major changes I plan to make? For example, we know one of the major changes coming up in this budget is um, the adding of the shift at um, the fire department, which we've known for two years we're going to need to do this coming year. Um, that's going to have a major impact. So I can give you a round kind of general estimate for what that might look like. And putting, um, I think we, we had a, um, 
we're going to have some changes in our debt to give you a sense of what that net change will be on the budget for next year. That kind of that kind of stuff. Okay, I that can absolutely. Yeah, that's great. I think it's a nice step to add to the budget process. Are we ready to move on to the next item? We are. Which is review of financial reports. I would like to start with the revenue reports, if we oh, could. Good. Um, so you will notice that nothing has really changed from the revenue because this is a report that I ran for you and we reviewed, but I had to get you back on schedule to, so when we moved the, when we moved the finance committee to the fourth um, Monday of the month, we um, ran, I ran reports, Tom and I reviewed them and I sent them out to the rest of council. They should look very similar to the reports that you have in front of you because they're, they're also for the month of December. The only thing that this represents is a reconciliation um, that finance did. But I wanna run through just a couple, highlight for you a couple of the things um, on this report. The first is um, we have a real estate um, abatement that is gonna hit. Um, this is part of a settlement agreement that we reached with CD Park 7. Um, so there's gonna be uh, an abatement. They won't see the cash, but they'll get the credit of about $60,000. And that was um, the final execution of that settlement agreement from their abatement that was request that they had um, taken all the way to the state board that we settled. So you're gonna see and that uncollected balance is gonna look about $60,000 more next, next time you see this. Okay. Um, motor vehicle tax continues to come in um, we are about $4,000 um, under last year, which um, I could see us making that up given kind of the trends that we're watching. So I think we're right on target with motor vehicle, which is one of our larger revenue centers. Um, the homestead exemption, you, I'm skipping revenue sharing for a reason. Um, yep. Homestead exemption, you, um, we see uh, two payments that come in from that. Um, I, we won't, we will bit, book the remaining balance of this um, and get that back um, after the close of the fiscal year. So that is about on track. Um, we have not, I have not received the final confirmation of the, the number that, the final number, but uh, we should get that. Um, I'm always happy when the University of Maine pays. That's a really big piece. I am seeing um, agent fees decrease, which I would expect to, because we're doing so much um, on, we're driving people online. And when people register their vehicles online, we get all the excise tax but we don't get the agent fee. So I would expect we're doing fairly well. Um, you, on this one, you'd like to be at 50%. We're just a little bit under that. So um, I am um, rental registration. We are going to see the, the whole of about $5,000. And um, I'm still, I'm working with our code office right now to try to figure out is that an overestimate or do we have people who have not paid or do we have people who paid and it got credited in the wrong place? So we're working through that. Ambulance um, revenue is actually kind of, we had a, we've had a busy um, month. So that's kind of popping back a little bit, but we're still um, $200,000 under build. Uh, that's not collected, that's just under build. Um, so we, we have a bit more to go um, this year. And I understand that that does not come in in um, even amounts. We tend to see the bulk of our runs um, 
we tend to be quite a bit heavier in during the school year, which um, so I, I'm a little concerned we're gonna once again be under under billing um, in the ambulance. You when, you when you say under billing, you you don't mean that people to get the service and we do not bill them. You're saying that we have less people providing the services less and therefore there's less revenue coming than what we had budgeted. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what I mean. Um, town rec program revenue. I'm not expecting um, much of anything in town rec or uh, you main contract programs and Part of the reason for that is that we are, um, we haven't been providing a lot of programming and what we have been providing, we've been trying to do um, at a much lower price point. Um, the um, pool concessions, we, we wouldn't have had any because we didn't open last year. Um, and uh, senior citizens rent, um, just our rent in general, we're not, we're not renting town space to people um, because of COVID. So those are all places that I would expect to see us take a, a hit. The good news is that our investments are rebounding. So if you look at interest earnings, the investment earnings, the $22,000 that we had budgeted is what we would expect to bring in on our um, money in the bank. Um, our cash on hand. And that's a little bit higher because we've been sitting on some extra, we've, we've got $2 million extra cash um, that we have from the bond sale. So that's helpful when you're earning interest on an extra 2 million. In December, we made the final payment on our OED, we, the economic development bond for Three Godfrey Drive. Um, which will drop our cash um, a little over a million dollars. That was a final balloon payment. The good news is on the next line, you will notice we have the reserve investment activity and that's the money that we've pulled out and are actively investing with the first advisors. Mm -hmm. So that's showing market growth or loss within the fiscal year. So if we lose money, that's where um, Bob, it books the loss. And if we um, make money on our investments, that is where Bob books the gain. So the goal is to be at a uh, zero or better, which a minus is better on the revenue side. Um, and so you'll see that we're up $39,000 since the beginning of the year, which is really good news for us. So that's not cash that we actually realize on hand, but it's growth in our investment account. Mm -hmm. um, and on that note, I also have confirmed our advisors will be joining us in, in um, February at our okay. February finance meeting. So other than that, um, parking fines are way down and um, people are, we're not seeing the activity in the Pine Street mm -hmm. lot overnight parking, which is where a lot of those came from. Um, and we're just not seeing the activity in town in general, which causes um, the, the, um, that revenue to go down. So the good news is we're not seeing, we're not getting lots of complaints of parking violations, but the revenue is down. And um, MRC rebates are um, trending with our trash. So it's based on what we are disposing of. So um, on, we're actually um, doing very well on sewer billings, much better than I thought we would be doing, which is great news. Um, I wanna go back to revenue sharing. I provided you with a chart in your packet kind of like that. Yep. Um, there's one that says revenue sharing one and two in the top right hand corner. And the other one is labeled as motor vehicle tax. So you want the revenue sharing. If you notice this, you will notice that we are bringing in 
revenue even higher than what the state had projected. So we're doing very well with revenue sharing. Um, what you don't see is I carry um, another set of numbers off on the side of the spreadsheet that show me that we're about $500,000 up from what I had projected and what you what you what you budgeted, um, which is that FY21 approved budget estimate. And when we did that, our hope was that we would bring in more money than we uh, were anticipating, but we wanted to be very conservative so we didn't go in the hole. At this point, we are doing very well. And if something happens in the economy, we should not have any difficulty getting um, the budget that we have adopted. So uh, everything that comes in after that 1.248 million um, is essentially goes directly to fund balance if we if we stay within the expense budget, which we are on target to do. So when we look at the comments that we got when we were um, going through the rating process when we were um, trying to float the bond, uh, they said we needed to rebuild our fund balance and this is a good way to at least start that effort. And we're, we're headed in the right direction, which is really good to see. Great. <laughs> Um, so that's what I have for revenue. I don't know if you had any questions or. Any, anybody have any questions on that? I, I did not. I'm ready to look at expenses. Um, so the expense report is what, 13 or well, even more, 17 pages long. Um, I will tell you, I've gone through the report we are still, um, there are legal fees. Uh, we have been uh, utilizing uh, town attorneys, both Bernstein Schur and Farrell Rosenblatt Russell and Russell more than usual. Um, some of it has to do with COVID and personnel issues around COVID. Um, some of it has to do with the bargaining that we've just been going through with the police union to be able to make some alterations to the contract. Um, and then there is just a lot of stuff that we don't normally deal with. Like for the first time, the board of appeals met and uh, the board of appeals has an attorney that meets with them to ensure that they do things the right way. Um, and the local board of assessment review is going to be likely meeting. So. Uh, the good news is that we have those protections in place for our residents. The bad news is it costs us money to utilize those protections, but I would argue it's central to how we provide um, services. The um, largest overage at this point that you will see in the budget there too um, has to do with code enforcement and that's that Board of Appeals um, hearing that we had to engage um, some legal services to help us with, and also legal services associated with a large violation that we've had in town. Um, I've talked a bit with Council Councillor Perry about it, um, but we have an individual that we had already entered into a consent agreement with. They violate. They had a large um, code violation that started out pretty simply as a um, doing work without a permit, but then it got um, exacerbated when they wouldn't allow us to inspect and then they sent pictures that were not accurate and um, it, it got bigger and bigger. And by the time we were done, it was a huge fine because it lasted so long. Um, I worked with the town attorney and the property owner and we've reached a, an agreement that will include a pretty hefty fine. Um, but that fine will show up as revenue. The expense associated with negotiating that agreement is going to hit the code enforcement legal line, which will go 
well over budget. Um, we keep, I'll keep an eye on that line. And um, I think if we need to make some budget adjustments, we can, um, if it looks like code enforcement is gonna go over at the um, bottom line. But we had a few months where we were not paying a code officer um, before we brought Pat on board. So we should hopefully balance. Um, I'm going to talk about assessing in a little bit, so I'm going to skip that one for now. The other major overage um, is in the fire department, and that has to do with covering vacation and training. Um, no, vacation and sick, sorry. And we've talked about that um, unscheduled overtime, and that has to do, we had a, an individual who was out for a long period of time. Um, we had another um, injury. So you will notice that on full-time salary, we are um, to the good. We're not at 50% on full-time salary, which is a base wage. That's because um, we are getting some reimbursement for that individual's salary, which we kind of had expected. But remember, we hired an an individual um, early to um, cover that long term. Um, and so we were expecting this to go over um, at the year end. My plan um, will be at the April meeting, because we'll go to March 31st, I'll be able to take a snapshot of where we'll be at year end with this position. We're waiting for some more information about our long term, the individuals on long term leave. Helpful at all? Yep. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking, like, as my staff says, I went around the barn a few times before I opened the gate. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think we, we, are, we are watching that fire department situation. It's about a $30,000 overage, and those lines added up. And if it were going to be the same for the next six months, that would be $60,000 at the end of the year. And, and that would be a hard hole to fill. Yeah, no, we're, we're not expecting it to continue at that rate. We've got everybody back on shift Good. now. Um, so we would expect that to slow down and the... Um, the base salary might go a little bit over, but not, not a lot. So um, Rob and his crew have, if you've noticed our winter maintenance by the end of the year, we hadn't spent a lot of money. He has, I've been signing checks and he has certainly been spending some money in the last in the last month um, with his with his crew, but still well within budget. And I think um, Rob does a really nice um, projection and he is projecting that we, if things continue the way they have, that um, we should end up with um, a surplus in this budget at the end of the year. And our goal would be to look with you if the rest of the expense budget looks good, our goal would be to perhaps fund a winter maintenance reserve line. We had talked about that in the past for the years when the overtime is just sky high or the salt prices go higher than what we had expected so that we're not having to budget for every contingency. Um, but we'll bring that back to you. Um, the tip fee pass through in solid waste is that is a function of timing. That that expense line zeroes out because that is where we pay. Excuse me, can you just tell me, excuse me, can you just tell me what line number you're on? 33, 690, 689. Page, it's page 18 of your packet or this report, it's page eight. So when our commercial haulers take their solid waste to perk, the town gets the bill, we pay it, and then we turn around and bill our haulers mm -hmm. along with the cost of our MRC membership and um, the associated um, fees 
that we that you approve every year in the fee schedule. I think there is not a lot um, beyond that that I'm concerned about in the budget. I don't know if you. So, Sophie, on that same um, budget category, of solid waste disposal. Mm -hmm. I'm, oh, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm surprised we're only 27% of the curbside pickup contract expended. Um, you would have thought it would be closer to 50%. So I think part of that is going to be a timing issue um, because we, they are, they bill out, there's sometimes a delay in getting the bill. And then mm -hmm. in July and August, where some, in July and August, where you were paying the previous year and the previous year's books. So it takes some, okay. there's a delay there. There is something here that is worth a conversation, um, especially with Rob on the screen, and that is our recycling. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're in good shape with recycling. That <laughs> is our recycling collection. We also, we had been paying 35, budgeted to pay $35 a ton for recycling. And we've been paying $135 a ton because um, Coastal is shut down. And um, we thought it was really important not to pick up recycling and take it to the landfill as some, or to perk as some communities may have decided to do. So the thought here is um, our tipping on um, town um, MSW is down. We are not seeing the same tonnages that we normally would expect to see. So some of that overage will be taken. We can use the budget for MSW tip fee to cover. If we end up going over the full solid waste disposal budget, we would um, look to um, either let it ride and give the auditors the note of why, because there's a completely legitimate reason right. for that overage. Or um, in the past, you've given me permission to pull from our solid waste reserve to cover an overage, but I would go to the bottom line of that. I wouldn't worry if, if right. that, I know that recycling line will go over. Okay. Helpful? Yep. Anything you wanna add, Mr. Yerksa? So Sophie, like I know it's yeah. pretty small potatoes in terms of dollars and cents compared to the fire department overages and whatnot, but um, can you talk a little bit about general assistance and are you seeing an increase in need due to the pandemic? Um, the answer to that is yes and no. Um, when we look at um, general assistance, there's definitely need. I'm not sure we're seeing it all right now. Um, we're about $650 over on our personal. Um, and I will tell you where a lot of that has to do with um, funeral expenses. We've actually gotten tagged for two funerals that we've had to pay for. Um, but we're not seeing a lot of applications right now. And I don't know if it's because there, there have been other assistance like with the SNAP program and things mm -hmm. like that, or if people are simply not availing themselves. Um, so it's important if somebody um, feel is having difficulty meeting basic needs and they are truly utilizing all of their resources for basic needs and there's a reason why they don't have enough income coming in to cover those basic needs, they should be reaching out to us. And if we can't help them through general assistance, we can make referrals to places that might be able to help them. Helpful? Yes. Yes, thanks. I, I think that um, there are probably a lot of folks that aren't aware of that as a resource, even the referral aspect. And, you know, it's just one of those perennial issues, I think, in this community in particular, there's a lot of maybe less visible um, struggling going on. And there's an assumption, I think, for a lot of town 
folk that things are fine in Orono. And I think that, you know, that's not true for everybody. And so the pandemic is really making that um, a, a bit more visible these days. And, um, you know, I, I hope that these folks uh, can, can see that this is a resource, you know. I think we wanna make sure that people are using their money for their basic needs. Um, and that if they are, and um, they truly are struggling, whether it be with medication or heat or rent or you know whatever the case may be, um, that it doesn't ever hurt to reach out. Um, they might not qualify because it's a government program and there are certain qualifications you have to meet. But if you don't qualify, there are other places we can refer folks to. Yeah, one of the things that I do in my current uh, temporary, hopefully very temporary job as a contact tracer is we set up referrals. Um, we have a whole team of people who basically what they do is to reach out to the local government um, and say, you know, do you have these resources available? And, and that's an incredible thing that, that folks in that state have going for them. And Maine doesn't have quite a comparable program, but um, I think that people don't often think about municipal resources or referrals um, when they're when they're in need. So I hope the message gets out there to folks that need it. The other message that could go is that the town has an emergency fund that is primarily used for heating and rent or medication would be the big ones. Um, sometimes it's for personal items like baby diapers and formula and things that might not otherwise be eligible under um, SNAP, um, that um, generous community members donate to and we hold it. And if there are people that don't qualify under general assistance, but truly have a, a need that we can try to help under, under that. And so if there are generous community members who feel inclined to try to assist, we're always we are always happy to accept those donations. Wait. Anything else? Um, the capital budget under infrastructure, one of the items that you'll see on the February 8th council meeting, I didn't think I needed to bring it here because we've talked about it so much, is the formal budget adoption for Rob. Um, to be able to have the budgets for the uh, infrastructure projects. Right. So we'll allocate those out. Some will come from reserve and some will come from the bond. Yep. Um, but I thought we would do that at the February council meeting. On um, And what you'll notice in this report is that we um, created a new fund, Fund 75, which is on page 14. This is where you will see the bond infrastructure money spent. So right now we have the professional services that um, I have to add the budget to, but that will be part of that um, order where we truly build out all of the revenue from the bond needs mm -hmm. to live here. And then um, you'll see Rob's um, projects listed under that as well. The $250,000 for um, fiber, we are holding that on the general ledger at this point. Um, OTO fiber at some point, you will reach an agreement with them um, for that loan. But until that happens, we'll just hold it. There is, um, Bell's going to have to move with some speed because we do have some uh, federal limitations on how long we can hold that money and not spend it. Um, but I see she's working at it. Um, and then I think that's really the bulk of the, the work. Bell is also working. Um, we've got major grants from Keep Maine Healthy and FEMA and um, we're on top of that, making the reports as necessary and working for the reimbursements. So I think we're doing all right. Is there anything you need to add on that, um, that next line, lean foreclosure updates? Um, so I gave you the tax collections and I, yep. 
other than to say, I think we're on target with tax collection. Um, we did recently foreclose on FY19 property taxes. Um, I have, I think it's a total of six properties that I need to work with people to, to um, get, hopefully get returned to them. And if not, I uh, will come back. I still have two um, properties that I'm working on from last year um, that I'm not finding a ton of success with, but maybe something will break loose at the beginning of this year. Um, so I think that's it for that. Yeah. It's just important that you see the the uh, reports yep. actually part of yep. state law. So if we're ready to move on, we would move on to item six, which is miscellaneous town operations and project updates. I'm going to ask Rob to come up on the screen because oh, I, um, I want to talk just for a few minutes. I just have to. I shuffled my paperwork and lost. There we go. So. Rob is here on his day off in his new office with his new wallpaper at home um, because we have faced a challenge and um, we have a path forward, but I want to just talk to Council just a little bit to make you aware of our thinking and our plan for moving forward. So the challenge that we are facing, um, let me see if I can Put the background together for you that um, if you recall we um, cut cut the part-time shared public works position so the position that was cut that was shared between WPCF and um, public works was not funded in the FY21 budget we knew that we had an opening um, in the equipment with an equipment operator that was having to retire um, due to disability. And um, the plan had been to get one of our laborers um, ready to move up into that equipment operator position and then slide the shared laborer into the laborer position. So you end up short the shared position who is historically the sidewalk, um, yeah. the dedicated sidewalk person. So um, we started September, maybe even August. I think it was August. August, we advertised. We advertised, and we ended up advertising for an equipment operator uh, because at that point, our laborer couldn't get um, a date for the commercial driver's test that you have to have a CDL in order to be an equipment operator. Um, so we went out through that process, found somebody that we thought would be stellar. And um, ultimately they um, could not take the cut and pay that we were, they would need to take in order to take the job. So we put it, we went back to the well and ended up with another person that had experience and uh, were ended up in the exact same position that um, they couldn't take the cut and pay to come. So then we went back to the well again and um, have somebody that likely, um, I think we might be able to make come or get to come, but in order for that to happen, we have to raise the wage in order to bring them on board. So when we look at this, for me, it highlights two things. Number one, one of the things that I heard repeatedly during this process that Rob won't talk to you about is the fact that we have a public works director that has an, a very um, clear reputation in the region as being somebody that people want to work for. And the town is being having a reputation of people wanting to come to Orono to work. So we are getting good applicants. 
we can't land them because the wage scale for public works is under market. So it's not just about landing people. It's about the fact that when I look at my current team, the reason that we can work with so few people at, with, and provide the service level that we're that we do right now is because we have a really extraordinary team. We have a lot of talent on this team and a whole lot of dedication. And when I see us shift out of the market, almost what frightens me more than um, not being able to bring new people on is the fact that that means that people, everybody is advertising. And so that means that there are places that might be more appealing uh, on a monetary side. And I would hate to lose the people that we have. I just don't have, I don't have any room to lose folks on this team. So I asked Rob to kind of look at that. Um, and he came back with a recommendation that we make a pretty, it, it seems extraordinary because it's so many people, um, but we would like to shift, well, we plan would like to shift the pay scale one half step um, as of January of this year. Um, and that, Tom, you're gonna be really happy because I was misreading Rob's spreadsheet. Um, that is an increase of about $12,000 for the rest of this year. Um, and next year on um, the full computation would be about $28,000. Um, I know it seems like a lot of money at a time when we are pinching pennies, but the cost to the town, I think this far outweighs it. Normally, when I face this issue, we did it, we had this very same issue happen in public, um, in WPCF, I faced this issue at the library. And when it's only one person that you're bringing in at a higher rate, you can shift a couple, and you have to shift just a couple people. Oof. It's easy to absorb within the budget. And you guys have never heard about it. It just kind of happens. But when we're talking about the entire team, minus Rob and Mike Smart, our um, foreman, who's on salary, um, but when it's that many people and we're talking about a much bigger chunk of money, I really wanted to at least tell you all what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. As Tom says, I don't think I'm asking for permission, but rather floating the balloon to see, to make sure that I have support. Well, as we talked about it this morning, Sophie, I think it's a, a wise move to make um, investing in our people and and you have ample evidence that our team is being paid an under market wage and making that kind of a move to not only bring in a new people when you've had a hard time doing that, but also recognize the good job that the existing people do, the, the team. I, I think that makes sense. And I know it's a big thing to do in the middle of the year, but I think we should do it. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, we often talk about personnel as one of the largest cost centers in our budget, but also, you know, our, our people are our greatest resource in the town and, and what, you know, what make the magic happen here and why people like to live here. And, um, you know, we've come up against this a few times in different departments about not being competitive in the market. And um, I don't think that any of our residents would want to see, um, you know, holes in our staff plan or to see a decrease in um, the way that services are rendered in this town. Um, and so, I mean, I think that there's definitely a very logical <laughs> argument to be made to, you know, to stay competitive and to spend the money. And then on a more philosophical note, you know, we have good people and they should make a good wage that they can live on and, and, and be happy with. And so, uh, you know, I, um, I know, again, as Tom said, like it's in the middle of the year and, and this is a budget that we tried to trim as much as possible, but um, I mean, this seems like a necessary expenditure. So we, the good news, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you, Lori? 
No, I thought that I, I think it's I'm agreement and I, I guess the twelve thousand dollars doesn't sound like very much and I just wanted to find out where that would come from in the budget since it's something that you hadn't expect, expected. But as I second what Megan said, we've already heard this in other departments that people want to come to work in Orno and we're very proud of the people who work in Orno, but we don't pay people in, who work for us a, a prize salary. We say, oh, the prize is you get to come work for us. But uh, people who have never worked for us before, they're not saying yes. I mean, once if, if we could give them like, you know, just come a little bit and you'll see how great we are, maybe they would come. But to make that choice to come and start here and we, we're getting great people who are turning us down, it's, it's clear that this is important to do. I just wanted to know where that $12,000 you saw it coming sure. from. So the flip side of um, having the problems associated with keeping an equipment operator position vacant for six, now seven months, is that we're not expending those funds for the equipment operator. So we, um, Rob has quite a bit of money saved in his personnel and benefits, you know, his wages and benefits lines. Well, that's good news. I think good, good step to make. All right, so I will make that, I will make that happen. I think you've had support. Thank you very much. I will tell you, I have come to kind of expect your support. Um, so we try to be reasonable when we bring the requests and we just really appreciate the fact that you do see the value in our staff. We've got pretty amazing people that work here. Um, so Rob, you didn't even have to speak. Well, I, well we got I, to watch I, him. I would just echo what everybody said. We are, um, you know, I can't say enough about the staff that we have on hand now and um, their re resiliency through this um, tough year. And, um, you know, they've, they've supported our operational changes without, you know, half of our crew is asked to come to work on a regular basis at 5 a.m. And that's just to keep the cohort separated to make sure that our department is, is resilient should we have an outbreak in the community. So, um, you know, and they've done that without a bat of an eye or a shake of the head. They've just, um, you know, done what they've had to do. And, and that really points to the quality and the, of the character of the people that we have. And I just, um, I'd hate to lose any of them. So uh, I appreciate this move. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Rob to just hang tight for just a minute because um, it, as we transition on to other updates, this afternoon, um, I had to unfortunately take the step of quarantining our, pub, our water pollution control facility staff. Their staff is just simply too small to safely run as uh, separated cohorts. We were hoping that we could make it through without a COVID um, exposure. We have not been able to do that. So we have an individual who has tested positive, which sends them home, but also the entire crew with them. So the good news is that Rob has offered to kind of step up and um, uh, we have two individuals that previously worked in that shared labor position. That makes that labor shared position just seem so much, so smart yeah. at this point. Um, and they are going to transition over to do the, um, minimum um, daily work that has to be accomplished. We've, uh, Joe is at home working feverishly. Um, we have received approval from DEP, um, Mike Laughlin, who is our um, DEP inspector. We've uh, received approval for our plan for how to move forward. Rob has agreed um, to uh, kind of oversee his staff with Joe, um, Rob here on the ground. Um, those two people will go over and do essentially our weekend testing and our um, daily checks to make sure that everything is going the way it's supposed to be and be in and out of the plant. Um, and then we've um, been able to secure all of our associates who are engineers will come up and do the um, 
more technical testing that um, I think Dylan could probably, um, Dylan Smart is Rob's crew member that's kind of taken the lead with this, could probably do it, but it's been so long and there is no opportunity for overlap because we had to send the crew home. Right. So Bill and Annalise are gonna send somebody up who will do our BOD and our suspended solids, total settable solids testing, um, which I think is two or three times a week. So um, we hope to have everybody back on February 3rd. If we have any positive cases, that will extend that time. So we're wishing our employee a speedy recovery. Um, yes, he's not indeed. doing well. Mm. So once again, really glad that we have a team that works together okay. um, because it helps us out when we get to situations like this. Yeah. Um, Joe said it um, it makes helping Rob through plow season a couple of years ago totally worth it, and he doesn't feel quite so guilty. So, um, on to assessing. So we had an early retirement in assessing, um, and I had come. I think I had talked with council about my desire to try to work with Vision, who is doing our reval right now, um, to see if we could do some contract assessing to get us over the reval and determine how much assessing we really need. Um, Vision does not have any um, capacity to do that. So we have reached out um, to a couple of other folks. They we're not finding a lot of capacity. So um, at this point, uh, Dave Milan is in the process of writing an ad that full-time, part-time or contract work, um, we are looking uh, to bring somebody on board. Talk to, the, um, talk to Roger Huber briefly today on another matter and just confirmed um, what we can do without a master assessor and what absolutely has to be done by a master assessor so that we don't overstep that in our um, efforts. And I'm hoping that this is one of those times that the town's willingness to help our neighbors when we run into trouble, when they run into trouble, will come back and our neighbors will be uh, willing to help us. And so we're reaching out to a couple of our neighbors at this point to see, Good. at least on the short, short term, if they can help us out. So. That's, it's been really busy. Um, every, I think it's so funny when people ask if I'm bored at work and I'm like, I, I'm not sure I've been this busy before at work. So, um, but not in a bad way. Um, and then the last operational thing, um, when we met last week, we talked about um, wanting to make sure that people got the news or some information about the marijuana referendum without necessarily having to go online, that we have a contingent of our population that online is not their first place to go. And then we talked about a change in um, our services from the through the town clerk's office, which as part of the, um, so I also am down a third of my staff um, in the town clerk's office who was quarantining because of COVID. We just got one back and one went today. So, um, but so we've had to kind of change the way we're delivering services and you wanted that to the public to know that. Um, so when I started adding up all of the postcards that seemed like a great idea to send, it suddenly became much more cost effective to do a special edition of the observer. And so staff has, I looked right before this meeting, uh, staff did a great job of getting Nancy the articles and Nancy is throwing together this special edition. It needs to go to the printer tomorrow afternoon, but should hit for um, that first week of February. So we're, hopefully people will, will see what we're, what we're doing. Good. And I, um, the rink, um, the pop-up rink, we signed the agreement with Dr. Tozier um, for the Camden National Bank parking lot. And um, we are planning, if everything holds, to be able to put it together um, on Wednesday, fill it and hopefully have it freezing um, 
and able to use over the weekend if all goes according to plan. So Great. that is where we are. Well, that's good news. Anything else that you need to add, Sophie Ender, uh, manager's report, we're, we've got all the news we need to get. I think you do. Good. Okay, unless there's any other business, we will mention that our next scheduled meeting is February 22nd for this committee. And other than that, I guess we're ready to adjourn. So I will just declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for coming and participating. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, folks. <laughs>